Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today, we are joined by one of our very special guests. You know and love him. It's Nightmare Vision. Back from the forest. Actually, Nightmare Vision was just telling me that he had subscribed to Highly Respected's IQ supplements. And now female owls in the forest are giving him a second look. I think he, he's definitely getting more attention and he's definitely appreciating the intelligence boost he's getting from IQ supplements. So I think he recommends to all the listeners out there to make sure to go to highly respected Substack and subscribe to the IQ supplements. So no matter if you're an owl or a human or a dolphin or even a tiger, you will see the results and the positivity that emanates from highly respected IQ supplements. So. I just wanted to, and on Nightmare Vision, I know I took everything you wanted to say in your intro away from you, so um, I apologize for that. But how are you doing today? I'm all right. Uh, I, I just want to, you know, support everything you just said. Like, the only downside is that I can't fly anymore because my head has just become too big. My brain is just That's... too large from the supplements, and I'm now bound to the, the tree limbs. Uh so. But apparently, uh, the female owls like that. It's their, uh, you know, they know that you're a sigma male among owls if you're uh, bound to the tree limbs. Like the, like the beta owls are busy, like flying and hooting to show their, you know, try to get as much attention from the females. They know they're simps. They know that they can't, that they're not the real sigma. But that guy is just so comfortable and his tree limb that, you know, that's who they're going to fly to him. They, they know that he's not going to fly to them, but they have to serve him. So, that's a real Sigma male move. And this is also some things you will learn if you sign up for Highly Respected's IQ supplements at highlyrespected.substack.com. But, you know, we have that, you know, wanted to get that out of the way, but we have an incredibly important subject to talk about today. One of the most important films of the 21st century was released recently. And of course, I'm talking about Tariq Nasheed's Buck Breaking. Uh, Tariq Nasheed is a uh, well-known uh, artist, rapper, uh, inspirational speaker, <laughs> and uh, and frequent cable news uh, guest. Uh, he, uh, I'm sure many of you uh, follow him on Twitter or see his tweets, and he is always guaranteed to give you good content. But this, you know, he recently been working on a documentary called Buck Breaking, which you may ask, like, what in the world is Buck Breaking? Well, buck breaking refers to the practice, alleged practice, that white slave owners would uh, rape and sodomize their uh, male slaves, their the bucks, in order to break them, in order to assert control over the plantation. Now, there is no evidence provided for this, but he did make a two-hour-long documentary about this practice. So, Nightmare Vision is uh, is a uh, Tariq Nasheed expert. I think he may even be a buck breaking expert. Um, but I wanted to get his thoughts on what he thought about the documentary. Uh well, uh, I'm none of those things. But <laughs> I will. You, well, you're not a buck breaking <laughs> expert. I thought you're. You know, you got your like masters. <laughs> no, I, I I must have skipped those classes. But I will agree that. Uh, I will agree that this movie is probably the best content of 2021 so far. It's probably it, there's a good chance it's going to be the best content of 2021 uh, when it's all said and done. Uh, either way, uh, yeah, it was a pretty amazing film. Uh, yeah, and I, I watched it recently, and uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed. it. I recommend everyone see it. Um, just you know there are ways to see it where you don't have to pay we won't give you away but you actually should i mean you know Tariq, i think deserves your download i mean Tariq is a good content creator you know we we got to support Tariq. i mean you can only imagine what he'll do next in his next and for his next documentary if you if you support this so i actually remember i think it's available on a like vimeo or uh, some of these random platforms yeah it probably is so, yeah, so you were, um, so you, that's all your thoughts is that it's just the best content of 2021 that you have, that there is nothing, you know, this, I want to say that what, in terms of the content created, when there was some time last week on TV on, on 4, 4chan, <laughs> pretty much it was taken over. It All the discussion became about buck breaking and some of the people on Twitter, all they kept tweeting about was buck breaking. Uh, this is, there was a, uh, Southern plantation owner, Groiper that came out to talk about how much he was, uh, you know, an expert in buck breaking. So for about a whole week last week, 
all everyone could talk about was buck breaking. And in terms of the quality of this movie, uh, people want to wonder is that some of the images he uses still has the Google Images button uh, included in the documentary. So this is how uh, high, uh, <laughs> high tech and professional this documentary is. That's real research. That's real research right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but like, I mean, it, the, the funniest part is that like, in a normal documentary, like a, uh, you know, like a, a move like that, I guess like a, an amateur mistake like that would maybe be like one of the funniest parts of the, the movie. Uh, but for buck breaking, that was, you know, that, that's probably not even like the top five funniest things uh, about, <laughs> about this film. Yeah. Like the funny, the probably way funnier are the, the original images uh, created exclusively for your viewing pleasure. Uh, in buck breaking which are animated depictions of i can't tell whether it's pre-sodomy or post sodomy of the <laughs> slave owners on the plantations with their their male slaves uh either way though the slave owners look incredibly pleased with themselves and the slaves always have these horrible uh horrible grimaces on their on their face and all i could think of when i look at all of these is that Someone drew this shit. Like someone made. Like Tariq Nasheed had a long conversation about like uh, about this with somebody. Where like you know maybe they did like a draft, and you know Tariq's like, listen, like I need more like musculature for this slave. You know, like, like I, I don't. You know, his face isn't horrified enough, or uh, you know, like yeah, that need... slave owner needs a bigger smile. Yeah, they definitely <laughs> yeah. do this, and even with the you know the people the the quote unquote experts he has, he's got in the movie, it's like all these light skinned like Nation of Islam uh, members who all like have like Doctor Jamal Brown or whatever, and they're like all like supposed doctors and professors, and they'll put them in there. Uh, he's got like a rapper uh, Lord Jamar um, in there who's like a fairly famous rapper. I'm trying to remember what rap group he's in. And then they have Judge Joe Brown. And then he has these random women in there who um, you know support the cause of uh, buck breaking. And he's he's got all these people going on in there. And they'll go into like really graphic depictions of what happened to their ancestors. And you're like, why are you talking about like why are you they're given like elaborate details about like how the uh the buck breaking occurred allegedly occurred and you have to realize like there is no evidence provided that this was a practice on at any slave plantation there's like one i think the only source they have is that like one plantation in jamaica there was like a gay slave owner who allegedly had sex with some of his male slaves and that's like the only like citation they provide and uh, well a core part of the like buck breaking is it claims that africans were completely heterosexual prior to contact with whites they the there was no trace of homosexuality among them but whites themselves are naturally homosexual. Like it, he goes through these, the experts in his, uh, in his documentary talk about how the Greeks uh, and others place homosexuality on top. And because blacks in Africa were children of the sun, that they, you know, they had all these positive uh, family oriented values while like in the north among white people they were children of the ice and it's cold and hard and they were perverted and they didn't create any civilization and they're like these uh sinister animals that are driven by you know total perversion and the men among them are prefer homosexuality because they cite like they i don't even think they say the spartans but they use the example of the spartans saying that like heterosexual sex was only used for procreation while like that the homosexuality was the preferred choice with their friends and that was just one particular society and this is you know uh, not uh, encompassing all the other white people that existed throughout time 
And they even say like, you know, white Arabs. I mean, it's funny that he calls the Arabs white, uh, were also uh, huge homosexuals. And even they say that Western civilization during the age of discovery was not like, you know, you're, it was a homosexual expansion because all of these explorers were supposedly gay. Um, no evidence presented for this, but this is their theory that basically they were dominated by these <laughs> crazy homosexual whites in the north and all like white men or apparently homosexuals according to Tariq Nasheed's documentary one of the uh one of the funniest things about it is that uh Tariq at least uh, I don't know about the other ones but Tariq himself throughout the documentary he doesn't refer to them as like gay he calls them LGBT persons yeah that's right he calls them LGBT and, and so there's like, like one time one of the experts like gets like frustrated with having to call them LGBT. He's like, oh man, I I'm just gonna call them gay, you know? <laughs> yeah, like it's funny. It's it's like very like uh unsophisticated. Like even like I don't really have any patience for like uh you know like all the like LGBT propaganda. But like I'm even like kind of like acclimated to saying it because like I see it all the time. And like they're just kind of revealing their their own like like I don't know. They're kind of like a little bit older. Uh, and they really don't have any patience for like the the nuances of like the like the newer iterations of like all this like ideological garbage. And I think that like that's like a foundation in the background of a lot of this movie, which is what I, like I found it interesting because I grew up around a lot of that, um, which is basically kind of like um, I guess you want to call it, it's like Gen X black supremacism, like. You know, if you grew up, like, listening to, like, rap and you grew up in, like, hip-hop culture and, like, you know, like, the 90s and stuff, like, the, the late 90s and even the mid-90s, um, there's a lot of these themes that, like, they're totally tone-deaf culturally today, right? Like, the, the premise of this movie is that, you know, these slaves were sodomized by their owners in order to humiliate them um, in an act of, like, racial humiliation, right? And that... This continues today in a symbolic way with um, Black America being propagandized by LGBT ideology. Like that's like yeah. a, it's like a metaphorical continuation of buck breaking. And so, you know, it's it's like part of what's funny about this movie is that like that there's probably like a grain of truth to that. Like I don't even disagree with that a hundred percent at all. I think there's like a lot of like truth in this movie. It was like our friend, our our, our mutual friend, current citizen said that uh, a lot of this movie is like very true things just filtered through the minds of an idiot. <laughs> and like, yeah, well, I, I would I would say that like the last half hour or last hour of the movie, you would think it was produced by like Infowars because it's like surprisingly conservative and it's all talking about how they're putting soy and all these other <laughs> feminizing products in the food and they're like intentionally trying to take over hip hop and make it more feminine. They're like making rappers wear skirts and Lord Jamar, who was a part of the group Brand Nubian, he uh, he talks about how he's like, man, this shit is gay. And I told these guys out that like they wear in skirts, that's gay. And that's not right. And apparently, and there is this strong push in like among rap to make it gayer. Uh, it's very weird because you can look at this like compared to like 20 years ago, you know, these were, you know, even like a pop rapper like 50 Cent was displaying a lot of machismo and no one would have ever thought like 50 Cent was gay and it was like the same with all the other rappers and even like jay-z and such but now if you're looking at it they like really do try to buck break these like rappers like there was a recent rapper who wore a dress on stage uh for a performance at snl like the rapper's name escapes me uh there's even like rappers who even like have a sense of masculinity like the baby who does like dances that are uh, rather feminine and like it, Tariq Nasheed attacks him and there's probably the worst example is Tyler the creator who got big in the uh, in the early 2010s as being like this very homophobic rapper who's like really hardcore and edgy and you know fast forward a few years later I think it's like 2017 2018 He's wearing dresses <laughs> and he's like, and he's talking about how he's like bisexual. And like, once again, you're like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> and they do really promote like a more feminine rapper now. I mean, even like the most popular rap is like mopey rap and it's like all, 
instead of this guy talking about how many bitches he's getting, he's talking about how he's losing all these bitches and he wants to kill himself. Or he's just like so sad or he's like getting in touch with his feminine side. And, you know, this is, uh, there is something going on with how, what are the bigger rappers and what even for their culture you know, they really are trying to promote these, even like outside of rap, they are trying to promote more of these gay black men as like the stalwarts of their culture. Yeah. And so there's definitely a point there, but like the first hour of the movie, which is like the funniest um, part of the movie, you know, it's dedicated to how this big gay white civilization was dedicated to buck breaking <laughs> and how like they even argued that the gay, ch that the Catholic church is a homosexual institution and the obelisk in St. Peter's Square is actually a big black penis, which the Pope likes to look out to and uh, think, uh, uh, perverted thoughts about and like you know this the is irony like the, the irony cannot be lost on you brother the irony cannot be lost on you brother but like and this it, is like the whole movie it's like all dedicated like white men just like going around like buck break, like being dedicated to buck breaking there's like parts where they they like claim that black women had to like hide their hair because even though white men are supposedly homosexual they're uh, more attracted to black women than they are white women, and like that's why they made the black women like like wear shawls and like and, like veils and stuff to cover their fa their hair, so the white men wouldn't go crazy after them, and no, the white the women wouldn't have to compete with them. And they even like at one point, there's like a lot of contradictory stuff. Like the whole movie is anti-gay, and he has Bishop Talbert Swan who. Even though his, like, name in the movie is listed as Bishop Talbert Swan, they, like, list his, like, title as, like, Bishop. <laughs> it's, like, underneath yeah, his do. name. <laughs> it's, like, and he talks about, like, oh, homophobia is completely a white phenomenon. Like, blacks, like, are so tolerant of, of gays, and we love gays. And they're, like, this whole movie is about how whites are homosexual, like, predators and like blacks like need to be aware of the uh the lgbt agenda to try to rape them and like you're just saying that like oh no actually we're the real tolerant ones the real homophobes are the white <laughs> homosexual predators and like, wait what is this this is this doesn't make sense and they they have like a total lack of self-awareness like one of the experts uh it's a female i don't i didn't catch her name i mean most of them i didn't catch their name because it's like nobody's and she's talking about how, you know, civil, uh, the corporations and all the powerful institutions promote the LGBT agenda, which is 100% true. And then she tries to claim you can tell that something is not a, th a threat. To, it's the dominant power structure supporting something if every corporation is supporting it. And then you have to ask, like, well, what about Black Lives Matter? You know, there's no self-awareness that somehow, like, every corporation is donning, like, a gay pride flag during Pride Month and, like, heavily supporting and backing, like, pride parades and et cetera, and everything like that. And then they, they like, think that, like, these corp same corporations are not backing Black Lives Matter and Black interests. Like, the... So this is, like, uh, yeah, this is the exact quote that I wrote down. If, like, if the dominant society is backing your movement, you're not really oppressed. Well... Um, <laughs> uh, okay, well, that I, I agree with that 100%, but they're using that in the context that, okay, well, that's just the LGBT agenda. That's not Black Lives Matter. That's not our interest. And it's, um, you know, there is a total lack of self-awareness going on in the movie. One of the, uh, one of the funniest copes in the movie was when the, uh, the, the, the female black um, speakers, uh, the, the, the women being interviewed, they were talking about how, like, the the white like the wa the white plantation owners wives were like taking these uh male slaves and they were basically like raping them and uh it was for the purposes of you know like like uh trying to break up the 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 slave families and like break up you yeah, know the black and, like, family yeah and the whole the whole idea is that like this is like totally against their will because everyone knows that like you know, no black man would ever, ever go uh, for a white woman or be attracted to a white woman unless he was being like, you know, brainwashed or like MK Ultra or something. Yeah. Like the whole thing is just like a psyop against the black male to like trick him into sleeping with his plantation owner mistress or something like that. It was just, it was like, it was very funny. Um, but like the, you know, I, I feel like no, like just no, nobody really, not nobody, but 
I feel like a lot of people really don't see the angle that that like I'm trying to say is like the genesis of a lot of this. But like even Tariq Nasheed himself, like there was a point, you know, he had a little career. What was his his name was like K Flex or something. He was like a yeah, he's he a was rapper. kind of like a misogynist rapper and stuff. And he's a little bit older too. And like this this kind of like Gen X rap culture, black supremacy stuff really is what like ties the two themes of the movie together, which again, it doesn't make sense to contemporary uh, in, in relative to contemporary politics, how it's like, you know, it's like extremely um, anti-white, which is like fine for the contemporary culture, but then it's also extremely anti-gay, which is like, you know, of course, like hugely problematic, but like, you know, in like the late 80s and throughout like most of the 90s, uh, rap culture was like really, it was like very closely tied to like, uh, you know, gang culture, Nation of Islam stuff, and like, that was all profoundly homophobic and anti-white which is like the two main themes of, of this movie and like yeah when you watch the beginning like yeah like that one guy's talking about how like white people basically became like rapacious sodomites because of the ice age and it like uncivilized them and you know greece and rome are essentially like empires of homo eroticism or rather they're like civilizations of homo eroticism and like you know, this kind of like continues through Christianity to the age of discovery. And so this is like completely typical stock Gen X black supremacy. Nation of Islam stuff. Yeah. yeah, like rap culture. Like this was always, or not always, but like, you know, through the through the, the 80s and 90s, this was always the crux of that kind of like gang, like, you know, blood, uh, Nation of Islam, like five percenter criticism. Uh, that would it was very popular in like in like uh, portions. And this of, is of a black different culture. five percenter from the uh, from our friends we always see on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah these <laughs> they, ones are these better. These were not these were not uh, FBI plants uh, claiming that even well, though honestly, they lived in the and, and and northern and even though they claimed they lived in Scotland, they uh, they cost Donald Trump the election. There, <laughs> these are uh, five percenters were like a break were like a more goofier breakaway sect from the Nation of Islam. Yeah, but, like, when you were, you know, like, I knew people, like, <laughs> they were, like, incubated in this culture, and they treated these people, they, they treated these guys who, like, repeated this stuff as if they were, like, sages. Like, it, it's almost like, the, it, it's hard to kind of understand it now, because, like, a lot of conspiracy theorizing has become so mainstreamed, but, like, yeah, like, back then, you know, you would hear these, like, dudes that would be talking about, like, aliens and the Illuminati, and they would tie it into, like... And they like, always looked, uh, five percenters love to refer to the science, the science, like, uh, they yeah. had, that was, like, a big thing with it, and they're like, oh, like, a rapper dropped the science, oh, wow, <laughs> like, that's, that's it, and they, like, these are the, you know, maybe this is better, uh, for them to pay attention to these guys than Dr. Fauci, <laughs> but it is, like, libtards now with, like, science, but, like, their science is, like how black people used to be able to fly and stuff. So. Yeah, I loved it. I got a total kick out of this shit. Like, I, I loved it when I was a kid because it was, it was really funny, but also it was, like, really traumatizing for, like, my mentality because, like, I was listening... I brought this up the other day to space, but it, uh, Second City Bureaucrat used to reference this this old rap song uh, by this artist named Razkaz. And he's the same, you know, West Coast kind of, like... Uh, you know, L.A., Compton, you know, artist. And um, he had this, like, really long song. It was, like, eight minutes long. And it's called Nature of the Threat. And if anyone's, you know, if you're listening, you should look this song up on YouTube because it's basically buck-breaking. Uh, my listeners should not listen to hip-hop music. No, it's, they're <laughs> only supposed to listen to uh, heavy metal music. I recommend to them. So I just well, want to make sure of that. This song, <laughs> this song is basically buck breaking the movie, but just like a song version of it from like the '90s, and like one of the, it, it's like the other thing besides how everything is anti-gay because they they basically uh, understand they translate Western civilization like just like in the movie. It's like this giant project of homo eroticism. It's also like they're they're essentially just like black wig nats like the whole world is this like yes eternal war against white and black and this this kind of explains why Tariq Nasheed like you have videos uh like in this one he uses phrase like the white arabs or white turks 
Uh, but then you also have him, um, I saw a clip of him on Twitter the other day where he was trying to explain how, like, you know, Santa Claus is black because St. Nicholas was like a black Turk and how Turks are really black if you look at their hair texture, yo. And it's like, it's really funny. Well, he because... claims in the movie that Moors are black, which Moors would have, well, I mean, they weren't necessarily, Arab. I mean, they were like people from North Africa, the Berbers. And the Berbers, eh, all the, like, 19th century race. Uh, racialists all consider the Berbers white. And I mean, even if you look at it, I mean, they would count as uh, under Tariq Nasheed's, if he's calling Arabs white, you know, the Moors are definitely white, but he calls the Arabs black in the movie. So yeah, that's just like his trying to claim that St. Nicholas is black, even though he's saying white Turks in this movie. And what's, what's funny about this is that like someone like Tariq Nasheed, he's like, you know, he's he's an interesting figure in a lot of ways because, you know, he he doesn't really sign on to kind of like the total package of like contemporary liberal race propaganda. Like, you know, he's like one of the he's not the only one, but he he would like object to the term person of color. Right. Because he's not really even like a racial nationalist in a way. He's almost like an ethno nationalist for like just black descendants of slaves living in america like he doesn't like black immigrants he doesn't like african immigrants he he views all these people as like subversive interlopers in what should be like a like i'm, I'm using like the term ethnic uh just to refer to like a specific group like black descendants of slaves like that's his group but what's funny is that like again you know these people are like really dumb and they don't understand how they <laughs> contradict themselves Tariq nasheed in in kind of like his, this movie regurgitating this kind of like Gen X black supremacy in, in a kind of like a twist of irony, they're really indirectly responsible for a lot of this POC talk because not, not that they want like, you know, Asian immigrants or Indians or Pakistanis to be like part of their grievance movement, but they were the first ones to kind of like divide the entire world into like white and black. And so it's like, it, it, like they're not responsible for like POC per se, but they are responsible for like seeing the entire world in this like completely rigid binary division where like everyone who isn't white is essentially black. And this was like totally part of their um, ideology again in like the 80s and 90s. Like Jesus was really black, like he had nappy hair, he wore sandals, you know, Buddha was really black because if you look at this region of the world and like. You see, you know, obviously a few years ago, you saw this on Twitter with like the Egyptian stuff, like the Egyptian uh, heritage debates are like the most popular instance of this where like, it's like they just, oh, Egypt, that's in Africa. They're Africans. They're black. Like, that's it. It's done. And anyone who says anything else is like this like insane white supremacist or something like that, you know? Yeah, and they, they go through this whole thing. And even with the Asians, like the movie uh, attacks Asians for uh, not being able to dance. They just uh, hop up and down uh, as, as in the movie they say. See. He's, got a, he's got so many funny theories. Like I, I just remembered he, in the movie, he talks about how like the New Orleans Saints are a, a buck-breaking uh, symbol, the, the football team, because um, in Louisiana, uh, Tariq Nasheed said that they branded the Fleur de Lis. He says Fleur de Lis, uh, not the Fleur de Lis. Uh, Fleur de Lis on the uh, on the slaves' faces uh, that they had buck broken, and now that symbol is used by the New Orleans Saints. Like you don't know, you gotta you gotta like really appreciate Scott, like how like for people like all the guys you saw on Twitter, like the black guy soy facing over a movie like Buck Breaking, like who are like they're they're almost all definitely involved in this kind of like pre two thousand and tens hip-hop culture like you have to understand yeah. how shit like that like you know drop in science on them like it really does make them soy face like i i even get a kick out of it knowing what their reaction is gonna like they see Tariq nasheed like so you see the symbol like it's the florida lease and like this is the you know this is the symbol for the, the the new orleans saints and this was branded on the slaves so like in a way like you're watching the team like you're being buck broken by brother like as we speak and like like they their their jaws drop like, whoa like, science yeah I like mean, they love show like <laughs> but that's like the same with like a lot of white conspiracies and there's like there's a huge crossover like i'm pretty sure lord jamar used to go on Infowars. i may be mistaken but there was like rappers like him uh i, I think one of the guys from mob deep used to go on like Alex Jones all the time and was like a huge Ron Paul supporter. And he was just in the same stuff 
as like these guys. And there is like a there is like a, a natural crossover between like white inf huge white Infowars uh, supporters, and even they go on. There's like a whole section of the movie about how like the white homosexual elite are trying to have population control um, in Africa and with eugenics, it sounds like exactly like a lot of the stuff that Infowars is promoting. And like I've said before, I mean, it's like a conservative message at the end. Like what they argue for is like blacks need like strong nuclear families with a strong father figure in order to to unbreak the buck you know and that's uh that's like the general solution i think most like conservatives are like oh yeah and then even some of the stuff that they say uh like about feminism and as we've been talking about the lgbt agenda like i think like a lot of our listeners would totally agree with that and it is this, um, you know, it, it is like, I think you're exactly right that this is, but this is like backwards. Like this is not what's at the cutting edge. If you look at what Black Lives Matter is, it's all run by women or gay men, or even like, I think that this is like a point that like, Tariq is like, talk about it. Like it's at, like African immigrants. And even many of them are women. I mean, if Joanne Reed and Karen uh, Atia, who are like two of the biggest uh, black women in media, both of them are West African immigrants who, like, their ancestors sold black Americans into slavery. <laughs> They're both from the upper class, too. So they definitely made, like, a killing off of slavery. And now they come in and demand, like, reparations for slavery when they probably benefited a, as much from it as, you know, white plantation owners. Uh, but those are the type of people representing it. It's, like, entirely female uh, it's a it's a feminine movement. It's something very different from the Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam of the 1960s. And a lot of people like have this, you know, oh, we just need to bring that back. But like that that's like never coming back. I think like the sad thing about well, I don't know if, if you would necessarily say the sad thing. It's just observing is like they are a people that like aren't going to have a masculine resistance movie because these are like the Tariq Nasheed documentary, like everyone in this movie, I think there may only be like a few experts who are under the age of 40 at all in this movie. Like everyone else is over the age of 40. Like everything that the, like the nation of Islam probably will die along with Louis, when Louis Farrakhan dies. Like there's not like this groundswell support for black nationalism. I mean, the last, like the newest like thing that they have is like the uh, not fucking around coalition, which is led by like an insane person who has like, and they all, whenever they gather, this is like those people who gather around with like guns um, at protests and like all these like white second or right uh, gun rights people soy jack over their uh, trigger discipline and <laughs> which they don't have trigger discipline because there's always somebody gets accidentally shot at these things and like this like group is not like a real thing like is not the real power in it it's like black lives matter which black lives matter is entirely run by women and most of those women are like lesbian too like the woman who had all those million dollar homes has like a wife <laughs> <laughs> and all the other leaders, uh, like, prefer, and a lot of these, like, female leaders also prefer white men, like Karen Atia. I'm probably not pronouncing her name right, but whatever, who writes for the Washington Post, like, had all these tweets about how she loves white men. And that's, like, the par for the course for most of these non-white activists. Like, they're the, the black man, the straight black man who would have been, like, a gangster rapper or whatever, like, displayed traditional machismo is not at the forefront of this movement it's all led by women and it's our our gay men and there there's no place for them anymore in this movement and i think but that is what has power that's what's getting corporate dollars that's what's like actually influencing society i even think for like most middle class black men like they don't even want Tariq nasheed ism because you know he's like very into um, opposing uh, interracial dating and most middle class black guys, um, <laughs> for what even what I see, you know, living, you know, when I lived in oh, DC and like seeing it around, is like these guys. Um, I'm pretty sure are big fans of interracial dating. <laughs> so like, it's. Like, I mean, it sounds. Want... It sounds yeah. like kind of like, you know, like a lot of people would probably deny this uh, at face value, but like, uh, or on the on the surface level rather, but like, yeah, the the the, the promise of like access to like white women is like a huge motivation for like 
non-whites in America, like economically, it's like a huge economic motivation. Yeah. Like, you I mean, know, it's not, and it's not just, I mean, it's not just blacks. I mean, if you look at like these South Asian guys, I mean, every like yeah, absolutely. Immigrant group is like, come, like, I mean, you can see this example, like when a white woman walks around India, it's like a God just appeared among them. It's like thousands of men like gather around them and like, yeah, it's like, this is what they seek. And they don't want like the independence that was, that was sought by, uh, you know, the black power movement of the 1960s and Malcolm X and, and Nation of Islam, they want like a mixed society, but they want like a higher position at society that gives them handouts and, you know, worships them. They do not want the message and the vision that is shared by Tariq Nasheed, which like Nasheed wants like an independent black community that doesn't have to depend on whites, that is largely autonomous. And, you know, they get reparations, but you know, they're not necessarily mixing and mingling with white society. They have like separate structures, you know, separate families. Uh, you know, there's not necessarily integration going on, but like that's not what necessarily educated blacks want, you know, and as a, represented by Black Lives Matter. I mean, Black Lives Matter is an anti-white movement, but at the same time, they don't want to be separate from whites. They just want whites put at an inferior position and like that kneels before them and gives them money and gives them jobs and gives them all these goodies. And it's essentially inverting the position that, you know, would have um, allegedly existed under white supremacy, but now it's just black supremacy. It's not, it's not a, they're not seeking independence. They're just seeking, uh, they're rent seeking. That's just, and it's from whites. They want whites as their pay pigs, not necessarily uh, to get away from whites. And like, like Tariq Nasheed is exactly right in this these two respects right like it, it's totally accurate to say that like the like there's like a quote unquote like like buck breaking phenomena wherein like any type of like black collective action which isn't isn't really as prevalent as you would think like a lot of it is yeah it's just like being organized by like the democrat machine like it, there really isn't like independent black organizing going on but like as soon as they organize they basically have to become subservient to LGBT ideology. But, the, you know, the thing is, this isn't really exclusive to black uh, political action. But any, all political action in America has to be subordinated to LGBT ideology. So Tariq Nasheed's right about that. And he's also right, you know, this is kind of the same way that, like, you know, the, the media and, like, all these, like, um, popular pundits on, like, Twitter and stuff, they all hate people who are, like, uh, you know, like on the quote unquote, like far right, because they're always pointing out like someone is like has Jewish heritage or something like that, because, you know, they're pointing out that there's this kind of like, like ethnic resentment or um, a kind of like insular ethnocentric component to a lot of left wing activism, which is like indisputably true. Like a lot of these activists, writers, you know, pundits, um, a, a lot of them have like a Jewish heritage and stuff. And Tariq Nasheed basically does like a mirror of this where he's basically exposing a lot of these activists of people at the top of these networks as being like black immigrants like from the Caribbean or like, you know, from parts of Africa. And like, yeah, he's right. Like they're total NGO creatures. Like they're not like, you know, black Americans from like Virginia or, or, or South Carolina or Louisiana or something like that. Like to the extent that you can say that there is like, um, like an, an, an American black, you know, like ethne or something like that. Like these people are not a part of it. And like, like Barack Obama wasn't a part of it. Like, you know what I mean? He, he like, according yeah. to Tariq Nasheed's definition, like Barack Obama doesn't constitute like a black American and he's 100% right. The reason why I like, th this is partly what makes him so funny is because he kind of points out these uncomfortable truths that kind of does mirror what the right wingers do when they point out that like, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is with a white man, Elon Omar is with a white man, like all these, that there is like a psychosexual motivation at the basis of a lot of left-wing activism. And the, I, I was listening to the other day, like Tariq Nasheed, it was a recording of him on like a clubhouse uh, where he's talking to all these black women and he's just accusing all of them of being bed wenches. <laughs> In other words, like they they're totally all just them too. They have no, uh, they have no response like that. Yeah, they, they he, just, yeah, he just totally goes off. He took out his go off juice. Yeah, and it's like went off. it's funny. Like their only response is like if Tariq Nasheed should start using like the Steve Saylor quote, like uh, phrase where like 
All you do is like point and sputter at me every time I point out how y'all be some bed wenches. <laughs> and like, because it's true, they're all they're all like either mixed race and they're all in the game basically to get white guys. And Tariq Nasheed points it out, and it's like, you know, it's it's unquestionably true. And then like the the reason why these someone like him and like everyone in this movie, like part of the reason why they deserve like kind of such disdain or like kind of derisive mockery and like scathing criticism is because like even though they say all these true things it's all colored by you know no pun intended it's all colored by this just like unbelievable irrepressible anti-white racism i mean that's yeah. just what it is and like it's like so everything that they say no matter how true it is, is distorted through this, like, they, they can't ever let this go. This is, like, absolute racial resentment for whites. And, like, this is partly why there is no really potential, like, you know, fruitful productivity for anything like this. And, like, what you said earlier, how, you know, yeah, we're kind of watching this thing, like, wither on the vine and, like, go away. And, like, the Nation of Islam and... People like Tariq Nasheed, like, the reason why I called it, like, a Gen X kind of rap culture thing is because, yeah, like, this is not, this, none of this stuff is characteristic of black Democrat American politics for anyone, like, under 40. And, like, yeah. part of the reason why that ship has sailed for them is because, yeah, like, they just will never let go of their anti-white racism. They They just absolutely hate white people. And not only that, but, like, they can't even conceptualize white america apart from these kind of largely accurate uh assessments that there are these like ideological assaults taking place of like lgbt ideology right like a lot of this is driven by like you know white women and you know white liberal activists etc like that is accurate but they can only translate it into basically like terms of like race war and it's just yeah. you know it shows how like it, it never will go anywhere you know yeah, and I think with and there and they have to imagine that they still live in a white supremacist society as like as I was saying earlier is like saying like oh if the dominant institutions back you you're you're not oppressed well okay well you're not acknowledging that the other funny thing they claim is that whites get to learn about their people and culture and public education but blacks don't and it's like what what <laughs> like that's like whites learn more about black culture and history than they learn about like america than their own history like that they make all these ridiculous claims that they have to believe that it's white supremacy and it's a very similar with the black lives matter the difference is i their racial resentment is more respectable i believe than you know something like black lives matter or, or ta-nehisi coats because all the like liberal ones the mainstream ones who are promoted want us as pay pigs while these guys just want to be separate from us i mean like I, it's like they can believe whatever they want but they're all i mean they are asking for reparations but ultimately it is so they can be separate from us and live in their own separate society which i, I think uh, some people would like find that respectable but and that's always been the case with like black nationals I'm a, I mean, but they're like sheer anti-white hostility and they're like stupidity about like believing that our public education is teaching like white nationalism to kids but like ignores black history is just extremely stupid and it does show like a lot of like people on the right have always talked about like oh we need to ally with black nationalists it's like first off the like black nationalism is in like extreme decline and two, these like people are just so like goofy and stupid that you can't like what is the what is the productive value in that like there's not going to be some grand alliance between uh, you know black nationalists and white right wingers like, like that's that's not going to occur it's just like stupid even and to even uh go over that but a lot of like w like people on our side always soy jack over like malcolm x and this stuff but even they ignore like a lot of the stupid stupid things that they were supporting they just see it as like a strong nationalist which is whatever um but i mean this is going on i mean i think one of the more like the last thing i want to say is like the one more interesting criticism that they don't go enough into, but I think this is worthy of more exploration, is their criticism of the black clergy. And black clergy have always led the black community. But if you look at it now, especially compared with like the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement was entirely led by black clerics. Now, like all the black 
movements are not led by like uh, preachers it's led by secular people it is not there's preachers seem to have no role in this at all uh you can't even like necessarily name like a famous like black preacher i mean al sharpton i mean is technically a preacher but i don't think he's like run a church service in a long time same with like jesse jackson and most of these guys have just become like uh corporate bureaucrats and then there's this like that humongous uh guy who leaves like leads marches and like north carolina his name escapes me i think it's like barber um is his last name and there's like a few people like that, but these people don't have the same stature in their community that they used to. Are they, they're not the ones in charge. It's like these random like NGO creations or these African immigrants who are leading this stuff. And, you know, there is something to say that that's like a breakdown in like the black society that we would have witnessed in the 50s and 60s versus now, you, you know, there is something that's completely changed about blacks and they don't necessarily have these autonomous structures to, you know, necessarily have the, have a separate life from like the white American mainstream. But now that they're so much a part of a white American ma mainstream and dictating it, that it's like, what's the, why care about it? Like now you can have like a job simply because of the a color of your skin and you can have all this power and you set the culture and they do make a point in, in buck breaking about how blacks set like international culture and american culture and that's 100 percent true and they make this point and that that's why they want to make them feminine if they like make the black guys feminine then like the white guys will be feminine too even though white guys are already homosexual but like for some reason, like if they see a black guy twerking, then white guys will twerk, and and there's, there's a lot of black like guys that. twerking. Like that in doesn't this necessarily make sense because it's like, uh, but then they complain about how the white gay community, and I'm not sure what they're trying to argue here. Um, <laughs> this this movie, uh, by the way, is filled. It's filled with images of black guys twerking. By the way, oh yeah, there's like, like a, a, there's a ton of like <laughs> images with black guys twerking for some reason that have no. They'll just like so, shoot to it, and it's like, what? Why do I need to see? It's, it's like yeah, you're, you're you're right though like this the, again like the she the overall like the overall like uh direction of their criticism is correct like over the past decades like the black family structure has collapsed and yeah even in the past probably 20 years i guess i'd say black religiosity has completely collapsed and so has these kind of the, the, the prevalence of these like mediating, like lower level local institutions that were a part of black America, like, yeah, like the, the churches and like Southern churches and preachers, the way they were like staples of the community. They're right that like all that stuff is either like co completely compromised or it's just like gone. And so that gets back to like what we were talking about just previously, where like the, the problem with them is that they just can't understand any causal relationship that doesn't just lay all of this at the feet of like their their white neighbors like it's all white supremacy it's all dominant society it's like the most simplistic like dumb um ascription of like who's doing this because it it all needs to kind of you know fuel their undying racial resentment and this kind of like racial binary that the whole world is divided white versus black and so they do diagnose some of these problems but then they have no idea what's causing it um aside from some sort of nebulous white supremacy like current manifestation of like quote unquote buck breaking but it's in this like vague and symbolic way that it exists today because you can't really point to any real way that something like this still exists and so it yeah it's like they 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 do have a sense that like things are getting worse and a lot of it does have to do with this like lgbt propaganda that it's like it's basically dominating black culture uh for everyone below a certain age to the extent that yeah like you said like they're integrated into this like broader kind of like white liberal monoculture but they just have no idea like how to do any like about regarding what to do about it because the only response they have to anything is like to just blame white people and to like kind of inflame their own pre-existing racial hatred yeah exactly and i'm you know i think that may be a good way to conclude the talk about buck breaking but i we're gonna move on to a, uh, a similar topic that is about the um LGBT agenda, like what it's been able to do in our society, which I think there was a great example of this that came out last week. 
this new Gallup poll that assessed American opinion of gay marriage. Well, Gallup found that 70% of Americans support gay marriage, with including 55% of Republicans. Now, this is incredible. I mean, this not too long ago, like 10 or so years ago, where a majority of Americans oppose gay marriage. Now you see 70%. And it didn't, I couldn't find necessarily the numbers who oppose gay marriage, but I, I guarantee you that it's not like a clean 70 30. I bet it's like only like 20% that oppose gay marriage and it's like 10% like don't know or don't care. And that does show like this is like how like powerful this like agenda has become where it's made like an issue that dominated American discourse for, you know, nearly 20 years. And now it's just something that people like not only support, but just simply don't care about. And I know there's some people always like tell me like argue that like, oh, I think no, there's like a huge groundswell of opposition to gay marriage. Like this is an issue that you could really take up on. And you have to look at what it happens with like, you know, we have been talking about um, the buck broken black institutions. But if you look at like the normal Christian institutions that were providing the groundswell of opposition to gay marriage, they've completely given up on this issue. Like if you look at the Catholic Church, the Mormons and evangelicals, they no longer talk about this. There was a, a good example of this in March, the largest evangelical adoption agency, which had been resisting, uh, uh, you know, helping out gay couples, like get kids, uh, adopt kids, and had and insisted that they support traditional marriage, gave up all on that and is now gonna help like gays get kids, which this would have been a horrifying prospect to evangelicals you know, in the 2000s, they would have mushered all these resources and made this like group like their last stand resistance. But this just happened and there was not really any con that much concern about it. I mean, the uh, Russell Moore, who uh, was previously a high ranking official in the Southern Baptist Convention, he resigned from the Southern Baptist Convention uh, a few weeks ago. He's a total never Trumper. He's like, really terrible. He like offered some mild criticism of this. And so did some other like faith leaders, but ultimately they accepted it. They shrugged their shoulders. And now this is the norm that evangelicals are going to help gays adopt children. And these are like conservative evangelicals. These aren't necessarily like the evangelicals who are like huge libtards. Like there's like a couple people like that. So this is like an issue that, uh, you know, was huge in the, in the 2000s to find the culture wars, but now it's not part of the culture wars. So what are your thoughts about gay marriage? Is there like any like sign that this is like going to uh, make a comeback as an issue? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that uh, there's a few things I, I, I think about this. And I think the, the one of the biggest takeaways, like I guess metapolitically, is that it's it's taken off the table because like that's kind of part of the process of the way things work in America that like you win issues by depoliticizing them after you politicize them to like an unbelievable degree. And so now yes. it's like, you know, gay marriage is not even seen as political anymore because it's just like, don't be a dick, bro. Of course we support gay marriage. Like, yeah, how does gay marriage affect you and stuff? Yeah. And like this worked. Like people, and I don't want to say necessarily support their arguments, but if like on a day to day basis, yes, the average person can't say how gay marriage necessarily affects them in a way that something like sex shade housing being built in their neighborhood is or immigration or like crime or anything of that sort you it is tough to say that like okay this like gay couple lives like 10 blocks from me and it's like well like how does that affect you it's like a it's like a very like uber libertarian vision of society where it's like well it, it doesn't harm you why do you care yeah, but I mean, conversely, what's kind of, I guess, like a, it, it may be like a bit of a stretch to say this is like a white pill or whatever, but like, it, it is kind of damning. It's like a damning indictment of the kind of spirit of, the, you know, the democratic man where like, you know, we, we kind of have this myth that everything is a result of this like groundswell of like grassroots uh, organizing and this kind of collective action and like a public spirit. like. No, not really. You just impose a bunch of shit top down through elites and then eventually the people just accept whatever you're forcing down their throat. Uh, <laughs> nobody really liked gay marriage. Uh, and I, I have to be very careful here because, you know, a lot of people, I don't even want to say it's an indictment of like democracy as a form of government because 
remember, this was forced on the country through the courts. Like, I just have to say this. Yeah. I know that a lot of people who are like, you know, they have like kind of like NRX kind of sympathies and like, you know, like, I, you know, I'm Catholic. I talk to a lot of Catholics who like, you know, they're like very illiberal and some of them take it to the realm of like, you know, like we need like a monarchy and like, you know, a lot of it's like whatever. Uh, but the, the point is really to kind of just, they, they just want to articulate this kind of like anti-democratic spirit. And I don't even disagree with that in its entirety, right? Again, I, I think that like this idea that like, um, society is, 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 is in a way like a product, just like a total product of this like top down elite cultural production. I think that gay marriage, the, the, the sea change is like a total confirmation of that. But in terms of like politics, I have to say this, that like democracy in America defeated gay marriage, so, so to speak, you know what I mean? Like to the extent that gay marriage was put on like, what was it, Scott? Like it was like 11 states in 2004 for like just direct like- Yeah, and maybe site. California, I mean, the most, the most, the best argument that like it was democracy opposed to it is like California voted to ban gay marriage in 2008. <laughs> yeah, like we <laughs> actually- only 13 years ago. And like, the, like California wasn't a conservative paradise then. <laughs> <laughs> no, you not know, at it all. It was still like a, it was still like libtard hell then, and they voted against it. And this is like the same election where I think Obama won California by like nearly thirty points. So this is like yeah. you know over like whelming, and but it, they still won by a strong majority. And that was due to these churches like putting a ton of resources into demanding a ban for gay marriage. And now that like groundswell of like social conservatives and those religious groups just simply don't care about it anymore. That's like, if you wanted to like, have like some retroactive like movement to like overturn Obergefell, I don't, I don't know, I probably mispronounced the name, but whatever. And like, there's no movement there for it. Like unlike versus Roe v. Wade, which even like then if like, there's not that too much of a difference between like support for abortion legal in most cases versus like, support for gay marriage like i mean most polls show that it's like uh, like 61 percent like of american support like abortion in most it should be legal in most or uh, cases but there's this huge movement to overturn it and that there's no movement at all about like gay marriage like and it's not an issue that registers among voters anymore while there is like a the white evangelicals and the social conservatives and a lot of like and you know still like very devout catholics deeply care about abortion and they will volunteer and campaign for people like if they see them as pro-life so there's like a reason why republicans stay pro-abortion even though they're not necessarily uh, there is like a fairly stable majority that wants abortion legal in most or all cases and but it's like a difference i mean the one thing you would say like the reason why there's like this strong majority uh, or there's like this strong push to over overturn abortion versus there's none for gay marriage is that no one calls people who want an abort a ban abortion a bigot i mean yeah they'll say like oh you're anti-woman's rights or etc but like there's this strong moral the abortion at our pro-life advocates are able to appeal to the liberal zeitgeist in many ways about abortion like they're saying like well we're saving black lives uh this is like harms the most uh, you know they're this is not about equal white rights for all this over undermines like basic liberal notions about what like life should be in america well they ne not necessarily they can't do that with gay marriage or any other gay issues so it becomes you know so now like social social conservatives had all these ideas that define them in from the 70s onward but now it's simply just abortion that's the only issue that they necessarily care about i mean they say like we care about religious freedom but they gave up on all the religious freedom bills in the mid 2010s like they like mike pence just totally backed away from the indiana rifra bill because due to corporate backlash and they just simply gave up on it so it's now just abortion that they care about and this is what they argue for it but it's you know it's it's something interesting that there's not a huge level of difference in opinion i mean it's about 10 points but there's still this like huge opposition among conservatives and it is like the one position that the mainstream will allow among their like token conservatives is like you can be pro-life but you can't uh be anti-immigration <laughs> and that's what they all tolerate yeah and i mean let me just say that like just 
So just like I said uh, before, like I, I pretty much agree with most of what you just said. I think that it's like observationally uh, accurate. But like, you know, top down changes can go one way. They can go the other way. Right. That's like a, that's like a live option. And so what I think that like, even though I agree with what you're saying, I think that people who are listening who are Christian, right, I'm Catholic. So, you know, I have sympathy for this. If you're a Christian and you're listening to this, what you need to be doing is kind of engaging in like, like I said, like meta political thinking, like higher order thinking uh, in terms of like, you know, how things are shaped, because it's not necessarily like, like, even though I agree with what you're saying, I don't think that you should like give up, so to speak, on like gay marriage, abortion, all these issues. But the problem is that practically speaking, they have been given up and you need to be trying to understand what is conditioning the the relevance of these problems. So like in this case, you know, you should be saying that like, it, this is like clear proof because you're not going to see the other side say this, right? Because they need to always portray themselves as the underdogs, like gearing up for a new civil rights struggle, right? Like now it's, it's the struggle for trans rights, right? So they, they actually in principle, can never admit their ideological hegemony and all the, the victories they've enjoyed over the past, you know, several decades, because it's just been one victory after another in a lot of ways, right? You need to be thinking about what conditions the relevancy of these battles. Like, why does it feel like you can't even discuss things like gay marriage anymore? Uh, why does it feel like there's no, like, willpower behind these things? Why does it feel like there's no kind of basis or or popular grounding for political action regarding these things and like a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know christians uh white christians in america are just they have zero cultural power like that's why everyone's talking about trans issues now because basically liberals dictate the terms of these debates and like they won and so now they're moving on to the, the next thing, the, the higher level. From our perspective, I guess it would be the next rung below on the slippery slope, right? Which is like definitely a real thing and it's been happening for decades. And so if you oppose this, yeah, you need to be thinking not just of like each individual like culture war inflection point, you know, like abortion and then gay marriage and now it's trans rights, right? You need to be thinking from like a metapolitical level how this whole game is being rigged uh, against you. Um, and that's like a really good analogy, by the way, like regarding election rigging, because yeah, you're right. Like once these battles are seen as like won by one side definitively, they become relegated to like a depoliticized space where like bringing them up is seen as like verboten, which is partly why you won't see anyone like be against gay marriage. Cause yeah, like right now it's, they achieve victory where like to oppose it is either seen as like a kind of like sign of being a irrelevant kook or like quack like fringe political stuff or if it gains any steam yeah they'll just categorize it as outright bigotry and then you'll lose the same way everyone lost in the in the mid 2000s because they didn't want to be seen as basically the equivalent of racists against gay people right that's like really effective and so people need to be thinking about that because yeah like you're right like the process of these things is entirely in, in the left's favor um they, you know, they, they have huge cultural inflection point battles over these things. Then they, you know, the courts just kind of decide like top down elite imposition that they go one way. And then, yeah, some time passes and it's not even seen as a political issue anymore. It's just kind of wrapped up into normal public etiquette and decency. Like, of course, I support these movements. Of course, I don't oppose gay marriage, but et cetera, et cetera. And you know what I mean? Like once that happens, even though you have a kind of obligation let's say as a christian to oppose these things like you're right scott there really isn't like any practical grounds for opposing these things right there's there, there's no like momentum on your side so to speak anymore you know yeah and i the one i agree with most of that the one thing i want to this is not necessarily a disagreement this is just a pointing out is that you're saying that christians don't have any power in, in our society and i think among like traditional christians yes that's true but there is a certain power with Christian rhetoric in our society when liberals are very effective in weaponizing uh, supposed appeals to Christianity to argue for every point from like gay rights, trans rights, uh, immigration is especially one which they've been very effective in weaponizing Christian rhetoric in order to argue for that. So there is like a certain power with like the power of Christian institutions 
are weaker and especially if they're conservative but there is a certain power of appealing to christianity that still exists but it is weaponized and perverted by liberals to argue for things that it's not necessarily you know mandatory for all christians to believe in such as like open borders or it's completely antithetical to christianity such as like loving gays and uh and loving gay marriage and loving transgender when they just say like they just imagine christianity just is simply a mantra to be nice to one one another which that's not necessarily what it's about but yeah this is like this is like a, a a thing you need to think about meta politically and it's not necessarily an argument that you need to give up these issues but it does show like if if you're building like a serious movement and people like sometimes complain about like their politicians not caring enough about the gay issues but i mean there is like a reason why some of these politicians such as trump matt gates and others you know don't longer care about that there's not necessarily a thing to gain by that in in contrast to abortion which this is the one issue that these groups now care about so wanting to switch gears again you know i if we could definitely talk about that topic a lot uh this is going back to like what a uh, favorite topic i love to talk about is like things i tweet about and the backlash against that uh even that last topic was sort of like that uh but over the weekend uh some people may have perceived that i'm a little bit too anti-white ethnic which that can't be true i mean nightmare vision is a person of color he's half italian half irish and so we we love our half Italian, half Irish people. But people were making this. I got in an argument with some with some follower who was uh, extremely anti Anglo, was trying to claim that white ethnics are are what uh, all is good in this country, and these Anglo's are just terrible. And the only good right wing, everything right wing in America comes from ethnics, which they then have to pretend that. Anglos are just New England Puritans, that the South was somehow not Anglo, but even though the South Southerners called themselves Anglo-Saxon. And yes, like a lot of more Scots, but also a lot of more English. And the Scots who came here were pretty Anglified and they've done genetic studies of lowland Scots, which is where pretty much all of our Scots who are here in America are from. They're pretty uh, closely related to the English. And they are, they tried to, or the person was saying that they're, uh, they're not Anglo-Saxon at all. They're Normans. Uh, they had no Anglo blood in them, even though they were um, hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of years in England. So it was like basically defining the Anglos as only a one section, which a lot of people get into this. I think there's a lot very, it's very easy to seep into uh, Anglophobia, which I, I mean, there's like two strands of that. There's like hating the like the Brits and how they exist, which I kind of understand. There's like some points there, but it then goes into the point where like the people who founded this country are inherently bad, and the only people who can redeem it are these white ethnics. And then it imagines that the Southerners are not Anglo's, which is just not true. Um, yes, they're different. There's some difference. There's a clear differences between New Englanders and Southerners, but they're ultimately Anglo's and they saw themselves as Anglo-Saxon. And generally, when you read academic studies about them, they're referred to as Anglo-Celtic. Um, they're Anglo. I mean, it's not like, and they're Protestant. So it's <laughs> they're not a part of the white, great white ethnic uh, movement. So I, it's not necessarily anti-white ethnic. I mean, everyone... Um, you know, white ethnics and Anglos are both a part of the white American ethnic group. Um, I just think that a lot of people on our side have this romanticism of the of the ethnic, um, which is ultimately a lot of cases not necessarily true. And it has to ignore like some of the negative aspects of white ethnics, such as, you know, all the radical movements of the early 20th century that like the communists and the anarchists were entirely made up of like white ethnic immigrants and you can't just say that they're all like like the groups you don't like such as jews or whatever there's like a, they were led by a lot of italians and italians are like the most notorious terrorists and but somehow like oh those aren't the real italians but like some like goofy like whites like supporting like some wacky movement in the 19th century that applies to all anglos and that's like the type of arguments they do um so some of these like ethnic divisions among white americans it is silly but i always have to stand up for anglos because everyone likes to bash anglos um right or left and like it's like the one group that everyone can agree on that's bad and even some of the right you know, imagine these things about Anglos that's not necessarily true. And they point to some like stupid movement that only had like 
a tiny minority in and they're like, aha, this represents all Anglos, but then they ignore the wacky movements that Irish and Italian and, and German immigrants especially were a part of. So uh, Nightmare, as, as yeah, a white I, ethic yourself, what do you think about that? I, I feel like uh, some of this might just be like a class distinction within these groups where like their elites kind of come to define how people want to like perceive the group as a whole. So like, yeah, like in the 19th century, I'm sure that like lots of Anglo elites were like at the cutting edge of basically libtardism, right? Like rabid abolitionists and uh, like all, all this other stuff, yeah, all these some, other movements. Some, I would say that the one thing about abolitionism is that like the Anglo elites didn't really like abolitionism. They, I mean, they weren't fans of slavery, but they didn't really like the abolitionist movement. And it also ignores like the other support base for radical republicanism and ra and abolitionism, um, you know, around the time of the Civil War and Reconstruction. That power base... The largest base of support was German immigrants. It wasn't necessarily all Anglo's, and they completely ignore the German immigrants' role. Like I think one thing is like we blame all this stuff on Anglo's, but we look we don't look at like how German immigrants and Scandinavian immigrants were some of the biggest supporters of a lot of these liberal and radical. I mean, they were like all supporting radical Republicans and wanted a very punitive reconstruction for the South. Um, but for some reason, Germans and other ethnic groups uh, escape from any scrutiny, but it's all like Anglos. And even in like Anglo elites after Reconstruction were actually pretty like good. They were supporting a lot of like ideas that we would back today, like immigration restriction. Um, you know, they were noticing that race is real and all these things. And like people don't want to acknowledge those Anglo elites. It's just that like suffragists, and prohibitionists, which like prohibition, like I, I think you know that shouldn't be included in your goofy left wing cause. I think there's some like pretty uh, strong arguments for prohibition about how like this is a way of getting back at like immigrants and stuff. And I think that's like showing like oh alcoholism is based. Like no, it's not. And uh, uh, but like they they use these arguments. So I, I understand like saying with Anglo elites, but uh, I'll let you. Well, carry I just on think like your thoughts. I mean, my own. I'm just trying to like parallel this because you are right. By like, by the way, like regarding like, especially German immigrants uh, in 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 the 19th century uh, in America. But like, you know, I don't. You know, it would be like the. It would be like saying that like the Kennedys or like the Cuomos are like typical of like the Irish American or like the Italian American experience, where like. You know, and I grew up like all the Irish I knew fucking hated the Kennedys. <laughs> like all the Italians I knew, they like they hated Cuomo. Why would they Cuomo hate the Kennedys? JFK was about to become a fascist dictator before the <laughs> for the CIA killed him. Yeah, like, like, didn't you know this? Like, read the like he was about to take on like every major institution that he supported, but uh, they killed him. Like, don't you know this? <laughs> and like, uh, you know, the the general, <laughs> the general. The general impression, I would say that the, the most accurate impression, at least in the 20th century, of like Irish, Italian, Polish, uh, even Jewish to a smaller extent, um, like urban immigrants in this country were like, by today's standards, they would, they would be considered, I would say accurately, like a hotbed of like reactionary politics. Like nowadays, that just translates into like, you know, voting Republican. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like these like kind of... Um, R remaining urbanite uh, ethnics, you know, in like certain cities that have been there for a long time, like they're not transplants over the past 30 years, right? Um, they may live like, you know, now they may occupy like suburbs more than like the city centers, yeah. but they definitely have like, you know, they're, they're like grandparents were from like, you know, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, right? Now, now, now they, they may live like, you know, an hour outside, right? They may live like in a suburb outside of one of these cities, right? I know, isn't that, that's true of like um, Chicago, at least. I know that's true of New York. Um, I know that's true of Philadelphia, at least, you know, St. Louis, all, all, all these like, um, you know, Detroit, of course, like all these cities in the mid 20th century were like, you know, centers of white, ethnic america um and yeah like their their politics by today's standards would be considered like you know racist um you know exclusionary <laughs> uh fairly religious um you know like a lot of these people's entire social lives were mediated by 
you know, local Catholic communities, right? Like my grandfather helped build a, a Catholic church in his neighborhood. Um, it was hugely important to him. It was hugely important to our family. But, you know, like, like it goes, right? All of his boomer kids, uh, not all of them, but almost all of them, you know, they abandoned the faith. They suburbanized themselves. This is kind of like the E. Michael Jones story where, like, you know, like you move or out of the, the city. Grand Torino is like a good example of uh, yeah. what happened. Yeah, like, like my that. grandfather yeah. was kind of like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> he was a nicer guy. Okay, he was he was a little bit nicer than uh, Clint Eastwood and Grand Torino. Yeah, <laughs> but like, yeah, like that that was his that would have been his experience, right? Like he passed away like a uh, uh, like decade or two ago. Um, but yeah, that was his experience. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, that's a great example. That's why I really love that movie, by the way, because I think that movie's like very accurate. Um, yeah, like there's this guy who just like, you know, he's not an Anglo. He's not an old stock American. Maybe he's partially right. Like, I, I don't know. I think he's right, supposed like, to he's supposed to be Polish in the movie, even though Clint yeah. Eastwood is like uh, is like 100 percent old stock American. Like he the yeah. character he's playing is Polish and his kids and his kids are like left the neighborhood and he's. And they've like given up. They've just become generic suburban Americans. They don't respect their traditions. And then he takes on this Hmong immigrant, and he sees him as like a as like a more worthy descendant than his own his, children. His his name is Walter Kowalski. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so right. Totally, that's right. Yeah. Oh, and like the young priest is trying to like save him for his wife's sake, and he just has no respect for this guy because he's like just out of the seminary. He looks like he's like twenty five years old or stuff shit like that. Yeah. Anyway, it's a wonderful movie. It, it's true. It does, uh, it does kind of strike home for me in a lot of ways, which is partly why I do enjoy the movie so much. And so yeah, like no one would describe Clint Eastwood's character in that movie as like you know, liberal, liberal, like, he's like this hyper-traditional kind of like fifth, uh, 1950s, you know, mid-20th century American, and he just has no time for all these other uh, movements. And so, I mean, yeah, like, but at, at the same time, right, like, the, the elite kind of white ethnic politicians that come out of, like, let's say, you know, Walter Kowalski's generation, a lot of them were, like, liberal, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. a lot of them basically, like, the way, you know, I would, like, they kind of, like, sold their their traditions or their people out to kind of be integrated into, like, a partially Anglo, but, like, a white liberal establishment, you know what I mean? That was, like, um, you know, advancing the causes of, like, liberalism. And it, in many cases, it was kind of, like, in total opposition to the traditions of, like, their own white ethnic ancestry, which was, like, largely Catholic uh, you know, fairly patriarchal, um, you know, like they, they valued family and, and, oh, and also to the extent that they were in favor of civil rights. Like, I mean, you know, people don't want to say this, but in a lot of ways, this like literally just destroyed these neighborhoods. And a lot of this was, yeah, due to like them being sold out by their own leadership. Um, so yeah, that, yeah that, that's, that's all I'm trying true. to articulate. And I think, yeah, and I think that that's all true. I think that one thing with the right is that they, while these ethnic communities were uh, quote unquote based in Red Pill, I think they ignore the Anglo communities that were also the same and they generally had better politicians. It's not just the South, but also what would have been called the Sun Belt in that time. And these places are the Sun Belt, even though when people think it's the Sun Belt, they think the South. Uh, but Arizona and even like Southern California at that time were like Sun Belt. And most of the, they had, there was like a strong reaction element there. And most of those guys, where it was like mostly old stock Americans with like old stock politicians representing them. And that's also like an element of like backlash against it. And even with the South, the South was like, uh, you know, was the most reactionary element. And then some of these white ethnic communities didn't retaliate against the, the civil rights revolution until it came to their doorstep. So I think, yeah, I mean, all this is true. It's not necessarily to bash anyone, but I think it's, that some people on the right maintain this I, uh, idolization of the white ethnics and this demonization of Anglos, which is not necessarily true. And, you know, people shouldn't be hating on these groups, but actually people need to look more scrutiny at <laughs> German immigrants and some of these other groups and not just hate on Anglos. And even with the like New Englanders, there's some like good aspects about it that you shouldn't necessarily ascribe like these few wacky movements and say that that's representative of the all the eternal so, swede 
the eternal sweet yeah the I... eternals like scandinavians are also been like very bad in, in involvement in these movements but like all these groups escape it except for the wasp because um i don't know i think it like they think that they can appeal to the liberals and stuff well, one and of the one of the things is maybe this like relates to one of the topics you wanted to talk about i don't know if you wanted to discuss it but like especially for, like in my family like i think a lot of white ethnic americans like part their the genesis of kind of their own like um intense patriotism a lot of it does stem from the fact that like they uh they come from like the world war ii generation like the yeah. serving in world the war II, like, generation as yeah exa example. exactly yeah so like a lot of like i know it's my family a lot of the people i grew up with like you know your grandfather being in world war ii is almost kind of like their in a way it's like their inauguration into being an american you know what i mean like it's like a hyper patriotic um kind of mythos and i don't know i, I mean i i know of course that like for you know like um Old stock Americans, of course, like, you know, were heavily present in, in all the, the wars, including World War II. But I guess it's a little bit newer for, um, you know, like Ellis Islander immigrants and stuff. Like for, for a lot of us, like, yeah, like the World War II kind of mythos uh, was like foundational for like, you know, their story as like Americans. And it, it like, I could, you know, like my aunts and uncles and stuff like fr from that, like they, they all were like essentially or are essentially like, you know, just like hardcore conservative Republicans and stuff like that. Most of them love Trump. And a lot of that stems from like, you know, their parents uh, serving in the war, you know? Yeah, no, and I think that's true. And then a lot of, oh, that's another problem with the right is the right, um, uh, you know, likes to dedicate, it has like these, uh, some outside the mainstream ideas about World War II, which I was like pointing, I, I think with the mainstream narrative that's now being propounded by World War II is that I had this tweet last week that uh, caused some attacks both from the left and the right, where I mocked that the, the the two competing narratives that we're seeing now is that the guys who stormed Normandy were Antifa, which they weren't. I mean, most of them supported segregation, uh, among other things that they would consider, among other things that the left would deem as fascism. And they're Antifa, they defeated the Nazis. But at the same time, Americans played no role in actually defeating the Nazis. The Soviets fought the whole war. Like we could have just stayed home and like the Soviets would have, they did the real fighting. Like the Americans just taking all the credit for that, which if you read any history book, you'll find out that like the Soviets would have completely collapsed without Lend Lease. And they're like, well, what about Soviet production capacity? It's like, well, they wouldn't have had the resources for that and the supplies without Americans. So. And you can argue like, well, you can argue about like the point of World War II, and that's like a topic outside of this discussion. But there, there, there are these comments that like it's, um, you know, that's like what the mainstream now promotes, which is like it c clearly conflicts with each other. Now, some of the right, uh, you know, one uh, person who, you know, I didn't realize that they're still around, uh, Richard Spencer. I mean, imagine that. That's like a real uh, trip back to a time travel. Uh, with him, you're wondering what he's been up to since 2017. <laughs> but he 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 uh, he got mad at me uh, for tweeting that. He decided to put on his fedora and he's like, "Hey, Scooter, look, the 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 guys who stormed Normandy were anti-fascist, and the Soviets did win. You wouldn't know this from your History Channel knowledge." And so, you know, this is like a lot of right wingers. They like to put on their fedora and say, actually, the so the American troops were Antifa. So when they go to a family reunion, they can uh, tell their dad and their uncles that uh, the grandpa grandpa was a communist and he should have been, um, I guess, in the Wehrmacht. And even though you know the family's like a like Polish, uh, you know, they they can then like hit tip their fedora at their family and like. Uh, really have a nice Thanksgiving by saying that their uh, grandfather was a total communist that so we shouldn't honor him at all. In the, uh, the Lincoln project, the Lincoln project just cut like an entire, you know, like, yeah, they cut a whole ad and... about how they're like anti-fascism and it's like an American ideal. And it's like, I think by the historical thing, it's like by agreeing with that, you seed pretty much the entire history of America to 
pe the pedophile enablers and in, in Lincoln Project and all these other terrible people that they can wave the flag around and take over patriotism. At the same time that the left wants to like like feels that they're disturbed by the American flag, like that New York Times editorial board member who was horrified at seeing American flags in Long Island. You know, you're essentially giving up this like powerful emblem that most white Americans see themselves represented by in order to like, you know, be fedora. You're you're being a fedora person and like you're you're setting yourself outside the mainstream by like agreeing with that, which it wasn't necessarily motiv motivated by anti-fascism. And even with the Lincoln projects telling of World War II, they completely cut out the the Pacific theater. Uh, they made, made no mention of them finding the Japanese. It was just the Germans. It's like, hmm, I wonder why they did that. It's, <laughs> you know, I wonder why they're doing this. It's like, they don't want to mention us fighting and killing uh, non-whites. And so there's this whole interpretation of World War II that, like, World War II is the central historical event. And I think the best way to, you know, deal with that is not to... Uh, play, flip it on the side, put on your fedora and like claim that you're a member of the Axis or, or whatever and like agree with like the standard liberal interpretation. But it is to, uh, you know, argue against it and to say that like these guys weren't necessarily fighting for the present order. They were fighting for what they, th they were fighting for their country. You can argue whether like World War II was like unnecessary and et cetera. I mean, that's, that's fine. But like saying that, like you know, they were these guys were fighting for uh, gay pride parades and Section Eight housing in your neighborhood, and they were Antifa. It's just like stupid, and you're alienating your core base of support in order to don a fedora, and that's that's my main argument. Well, it's, with it. it's, I, be, it's, it's much better to say that these guys were not Antifa and that they would have been they would have been agreeing with us today rather than imagining that they are the um, 1940s equivalent to blue-haired uh, transgender people throwing Molotov cocktails at federal courthouses in Portland. Well, the tr I mean, the, the, real, the real red pill, Scott, is that the truth is that the World War II generation would not uh, agree with us because uh, they would just consider us too left-wing. <laughs> That is true. I mean, there, there, and there's also was problems with, with the lead, at least with the leadership of the greatest generation. I mean, if you, they were the ones who supported, like, accepted the civil rights revolution and etc. But they were also the people who were the ones responsible for the backlash. I think there is like a problem with the leadership of the greatest generation, and there are questions about it. But I think it's much better to. Speak the truth about them and like saying they're not Antifa and they were not fighting for the present order rather than, you know, deciding to uh, alienate yourself from like the entire mainstream and, you know, wear a Nazi armband along with your fedora. I mean, I'll it's say, like whatever. Let me just say two things, though, about this, because it, it, there is like a relationship here between like people... Well, first of all, let me just say, like, this is really, in terms of just, like, anal analyzing the propaganda itself, this is, like, so bottom tier. Like, you know, you know, saying that, like, you know, 100 million people were killed in the Holocaust, so, like, constantly, you know, bumping up the number by, like, another multiple every year or whatever, that was, like, really powerful. That had, like, that had, like, a total stranglehold on, like, American politics and public education for, like, decades. But this this new angle of, like, you know, Lincoln Project and, like, um, you know, like media conglomerates telling you that like the World War II soldiers were Antifa. Like this is so bad from like a propaganda angle. It just sucks. It's so, it's so like low grade. Like it doesn't even feel like it's worthy of like opposing. It's just, it's like, you know, they hate all these people. They hate everybody who was alive at the time, practically, except like a few of their like political forebears that they like lionize. Um, like the it's Tuskegee so, Airmen actually yeah. are probably the only people like, that so, are going to be so uh, World War II soldiers. It's so transparent that like it doesn't even accomplish. I feel like what they wanted. I don't even know exactly what they wanted to what they want to accomplish with it. But the other thing um, that's interesting about this is that it does show there's a kind of transgressive relationship between like the the left like the online left and like elements of the the online right which thankfully on the right they've kind of been marginalized which i think is definitely good but you know in like 2015 and like 2016 the criticism was not that like this the literal like world war ii vets 
Like, you know, English and American soldiers in World War II were fighting for gay marriage and things like that. The, the criticism was that they wouldn't have fought if they knew that this is what their own country was going to do to them when they got back. Like, just a complete war of, like, integration, you know, destroying their neighborhoods, turning their kids gay, uh, you know, destroying their churches, having the, the next generation totally abandon the religions that a lot of these guys would have died for. That is not the same thing as saying that they were fighting for that. Because they're like yeah. literally Antifa. And on the flip side, on the left, like I see this from the online left, this kind of like embarrassing hagiography hey of like the Soviet uh, effort in the war by like, you know, like self styled communists who probably live in like suburban Ohio or some shit like who that. Who would have been executed by the Soviets yeah, too? And like, even like the Soviet war effort. They were completely incompetent. Like, the, the only reason the Soviets won is because they were willing to kill. They didn't care about how many of their own people died. And they're like, well, they lost so many people. Yeah, because they're fucking terrible. They were a fucking terrible army that just, like, sent, like, hundred millions of their people to their deaths. And they didn't care, like, how many. Like, if you're throwing all these bodies, like, as somebody pointed out, it's like, you know, war isn't like a Call of Duty kill count. <laughs> like, you know, this is... The like just because they lost a lot of people. I mean, if they'd fought more effectively, I mean, they wouldn't have lost that many people. But it's like yeah, they're it's, like it's... they claim more right because they lost all these people. And even I think the Soviet dead is like been exaggerated by the Soviets um, in their regard. But are I you mean, a, are topic. you a Soviet casualty denier, Scott? I think I, I think I think most of, well they're elevating it to like 40 million now and it's like how the hell did they lose 40 million people you know they're like elevating to such ridiculous numbers like I I would agree that they probably lost like at least like 10 million that sounds like uh, and that's including civilians that's probably they did lose the most amount of I'm people trying to, but I'm it was also to... a lot of the a lot of those people that they intentionally like killed themselves or they were just like throwing bodies at the Germans and like the Germans were overwhelmed by the amount of people that they were willing to sacrifice. And so that is like something to say that like, yeah, it's like, uh, and even with these Antifa, I've seen Antifa accounts both retweet like the D-Day, like memorial stuff, like commemorating the Antifa storm Normandy, as well as like denying that the Americans played the uh, any type of like crucial role in World War II. And like this is like going to be the standard history. I don't know. I don't even know why they necessarily promote the pro-Soviet stuff. Is that also supports like a, uh, like a like a more realistic assessment of Russia and not seeing them as the great villain? But all these things can apparently exist now. And um, well, and this also is I mean, like the standard history. So you you have like okay, like in yeah, like from a tactical perspective, right? You have like yeah, like the the Soviet Union, uh, which basically yeah, like you're right, like. That's not really something to brag about. Like, they lost an entire generation of their men uh, in that war. Like, <laughs> even, if those, even if those numbers aren't entirely accurate, like, it, I mean, they are right, like, in terms of, like, the fact that they lost orders of magnitude more men. And, of course, they were also notorious for, like, you know, brutalizing the German population uh, after the war, which is, like, weird for, like, leftists to, uh, you know, like, women being raped and, 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 and really, like awful things like that. But then on top of it, like just to, just to really kind of drive home how, you know, you have like 21st century, you know, suburban Americans or like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, far, far kind of far right, like weirdos or whatever, like totally distorting the historical like record. Like those millions of Russian men did not go to fight and die for like communism. Like, they, you know, like they, they were just like patriotic citizens fighting for their country. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. like over ideologize these things. Like you know, like my family didn't go for like uh, you know whatever the American mythos was or like whatever the American propaganda was about like like we need to bring democracy to blah blah blah. Like no, they they just love their country and they served out of a sense of like patriotic duty to their country. And so this this kind of like leftist narrative that like all these people were like theory cells who finally decided to pick up guns after they finished like the Das Kapital or something like that. it's the most ridiculous thing in the world like these were like 18 year old like kids man and, like, they were sent by their country they were drafted and conscripted to go fight and they did it because you know like it, and it, it's kind of it, it's sad in a way I, I don't want to say it's like a total you know the two world wars in a way were like the death knell of 
this level of patriotic loyalty to your fatherland. And in a way, I kind of want to say that the World Wars kind of deserve that as a fallout. Like, they kind of squandered the, the idea. They, they, they kind of took the, the, the traditional patriotic capital, so to speak, this, the social capital that existed in terms of the relationship between citizens and their countries. In a lot of ways, like, World War I and II represented, like, the death of that. Which is like, you know, yeah. it kind of helps explain why Vietnam was so tumultuous as a domestic issue. Because, you know, people just started to realize, you know, our leaders are lying to us and we're not going to just be conscripted off to this war without a fight. Um, but yeah, like the idea that all these guys were like total ideologues who were like marching through the snow to impose, uh, you know, like Soviet communism on everybody. Like, no, they were, they were just regular people that were told to go fight by their country and they did it because... That's what you did, you know? Yeah. And that also applies to the Germans, even though... Uh, exactly. Some, it does apply uh, to them, too. That's important. They're like, oh, we're, we got a vision of the future. We're definitely fighting against this. It's like, uh, no, I think a current, current citizen had a really funny tweet that, like, everything would be the same when the Nazis accept it be Desmond is wunderbar <laughs> instead of Desmond is awesome, the, like, the transgender kid. <laughs> There's, like, a there is a point there, but that's all for a, that's a all for a different topic but i want to move on to our cognitive elite questions yes as i've been saying on on most on our most recent episodes you can get the power to ask me or guest questions or suggest guests or topics if you sign up for the cognitive elite option at highly respected substack which is at highly respected.substack.com this one comes from tim he asks what are my thoughts about the the James Lindsay versus Clara Lehman fight? Which is, uh, if you guys have noticed, is like the intellectual dark web and these like enlightened centrists really hate James Lindsay. I feel like you don't know who these people are. James Lindsay is now like one of the most popular people go to like anti critical race theory people. Uh, he's like a former like researcher who's like now he wrote a big book about critical race theory. He's like on Fox News all the time. And he posts like uh, like his tweets are all over the place, but he occasionally gets into base like stuff because like accidentally. And they Claire Layman and Intellectual Dark Web and Quillette types were all upset that he pointed out like he made the natural point that like a lot of this anti-white rhetoric could lead to whites getting killed. And Claire Lehman, in order to defend her respectability, said that he endorsed white genocide theory and he must renounce this. And uh, Claire Lehman then like uh, proceeded to uh, call her critics incels who just need to marry if they're worried about white genocide theory. And uh, of course, she uh, she didn't like go after BAP again and say how great she is at anal sex um, again. So that we we have to appreciate that. Uh, she one time did this against Broad Sage Perver for some reason. She talked about her uh, prowess in anal sex, which I don't know why a mother would say that in public, but uh, I'm not Claire Lehman. So this is like the thing of like, what are the fights? I like a lot of people hate on James Lindsay and James Lindsay is like cringe and goofy, but like the people who really hate James Lindsay are worse than James Lindsay. And I think hating on him Rather than imagine, like thinking that he's like an entertaining person, unintentionally entertaining, and generally he does have a huge audience where he does sometimes say like very base things that are accidental, and he wakens up to these people. I would say he is much better than the intellectual dark web crowd, and a lot of people who hate on him too. Uh, like I, I do think that that's like a red flag to like mocking and making fun of Jane Lindsay is very different from like being like driven by hate towards him. I do think that's a red flag. So in this regard, I think like the reason why they're hating on James Lindsay is he jeopardizes the respectability of these enlightened centrists and intellectual dark web types who never like to make conclusions about this stuff. And their solution to everything is just to read Camille Paglia and return to 1990s liberalism. And there's never any, and they always like, oh, race, it doesn't exist. I mean, even though James Lindsay would probably say that, but James Lindsay would actually say, well, all this anti-white rhetoric is going to lead to something bad, which they're like, no, well, the bad thing is it's going to end critical free thinking among non-whites. Like that would be what the intellectual dark web and Clara Lama would say. And it's all just to defend the respectability. So in this fight, yeah, I would uh, pick James Lindsay. Um, and even in most of the like criticism of him, I he posts goofy stuff all the time, and 
uh, he he is kind of he is he is cringe, but uh, the people who hate who are haters of James Lindsay are generally worse than James Lindsay. So, what are your thoughts on this nightmare? Um, well, let me try to be polite. Okay, let me just let me try to be like you know as as like respectable as I can. Um, like who cares what a dumb retarded bitch like Claire Lemon has to say about absolutely <laughs> anything? Like who the who cares? Like, this woman is so stupid. And she's already embarrassed herself more than any of the quote-unquote incels that she's insulted on Twitter. I mean, she has already made it clear that she has, like, weird, like, uh, like deviant, like, fet sex fetishes that she can't help but, like, publicly express. It's so funny that, um, you know, really stupid people like her... You know, like, they do this thing, like, oh, like, everyone I don't like is... Like, yeah, she, I saw that tweet of hers, like, everyone I don't like is this disgruntled incel who can't get laid. It's like, bitch, you're talking about, like, anal sex on fucking Twitter. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, yeah, I haven't you're seen like a, a Roper do that. It. She's like, she posts, like, like all the time, like, people send, like, uh, is show me, like, her Instagram and stuff, and it's, like, all, like, bikini shots. I'm like... Ma'am, like you're trying yeah. to be a serious intellectual, and you're a mother, and you're showing off like doing like spank bank shit. And I'm like, C be respectable. Come on, like why are you why are you doing this? Like it's like so bad with like women. Uh, another another uh, <laughs> problem with women. And she actually the funny thing about Claire Lemon, she got big by criticizing the migration crisis in 2015. And I think she was like a commentator then, but she was like one of the few big commentators to really go after the refugees and stuff. But now she's like says like, oh, I have no opinion about immigration. And she's even said like pro-immigration stuff. And it is like, it's like so stupid. But I want to go to their point of like, any time that like people on the right like uh, want to criticize, they're just like, well, why don't you just have kids? Like, uh, you know, the these childless people are attacking me. And I think Bronze Age Pervert had a very good uh, point to this. It is like, having children is not a political act. It's just like what people do. And yeah, like, exactly. it doesn't like resist a, against these powers because he pointed out that there's been all these slave populations that were able to reproduce themselves. But you know they were they were still slaves. They were not they, just by having kids doesn't mean that like uh, anti-white racism ends. It just means that you're having kids. I mean it's like a natural drive in, in society. And I always get mad when like these are. I think it's becoming dumber when like any like people on the right who have kids, they uh, too often on Twitter they act like that they are a combat veteran in terms of like the the like uh, uh, the degree of respect and like authority that they deserve that's like oh i have children it's like well that's nice and that's good but at the same time it's like a natural part it doesn't make you like a combat veteran just because you have a child and a lot of people who have like they, and they've always like said like we need more family men in this and like i think like some of the most insane people i have met in the movement are like would you would think that they're like stable family men, but like once they like like get in their like uh, Twitter persona or whatever, they become like total maniacs or like demanding like like terrorism and stuff. And it's like yeah, deranged, uh, yeah. no, 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 no. Please don't uh, advocate for this. And I, I always think it's like when people try to appeal to like being I, in certain scenarios, like being a parent, I think does have a greater gives you greater credibility on certain subjects but at the same time like being a public dissident is like creates problems with being like uh like uh, like having a family because like they go after your family if you could talk to people like like jared taylor and stuff and they, like there's been problems with like uh you know people going after their kids and you have to worry and like also most like women in america don't necessarily want to uh <laughs> Like the like uh the they want like a stable like family provider, not necessarily some person who's like threatened with arrest due to their political beliefs, and that's just like the nature of women. So it's like you know I, I always I think it's getting tiresome with all these people who are like make these appeals, and it's like this like the fact that they have children makes them like a like in the same degree as like a combat veteran in like general politics, the like well, like. Yeah, it's you know, like, what that's you have nice. Is like, like, we support, we want people having children. We want families. But at the same time, 
at the same time, having a family and having children is not an act of resistance. It's just something you do. And it's not, as Bronze Age Pervert says, it's not an act, it's not a political act. Yeah, Bap, Bap is act absolutely right. And I, I did see that tweet and it was really good because of course, like, you know, of course we all know about, you know, the, the absolute superpowers of Africa and India, right? So like bigger, you know, of course, bigger populations, people having kids necessarily equates into like, you know, unstoppable political power, right? Because otherwise yeah. these places wouldn't be, you know, of course, like planet Earth wouldn't be dominated by the continent of Africa with billions and billions of people, right? So like, yeah, it, it was, it was a, 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 of course I'm kidding, right? So like, yeah, like, so Bron uh, Bronze Age Pervert's uh, tweet was absolutely correct. And like, you know, I mean, generally I would say that like part of the, the family stuff comes from the desire, I think people just want like a desire of social proof uh for dissident politics because i do think this is true i think that when people make certain uh you know topics of discussion verboten i think there's kind of like a feedback loop where the people that become attracted to it tend to have like you know transgressive and potentially antisocial tendencies and i think that in large part we use having a family right as a kind of like social proof against that like oh no no no, i have a wife like someone was willing to have sex with me or like i actually <laughs> reproduced like i reproduced and had kids i'm normal and like you're you're right like the truth is that i don't think that's a bad like rule of thumb i don't think it's like a totally wrong rule of thumb but uh, yeah you're right i know that too uh it's not universally true and i don't know what to tell people my only advice i mean this might sound whatever but Listen, man, you got to be yourself, okay? If you're on Twitter that's talking right. about shit that's wrong and people go, oh, you're like an incel, you're maladjusted, you're dangerous, you're a potential shooter. Like, I don't know what to, like, you, you don't, like, if your idea is that you need to get married and have kids so people don't think you're a weirdo on Twitter, like, I don't know what to tell you. Just don't be any of those things, okay? Just be yourself and, yeah, like, stop relying on these kind of, like, external signs of social proof. Because again, like, look at the people who are accusing you of this. People like Claire Lemon. Like, you have these weirdos talking about this, like, weird shit. You have, like, women in their 40s who are thirst trapping while they have kids on Instagram. They're the ones that are looking at you like you need to provide social proof to them. Who gives a shit what these people think, frankly? You know what I mean? Like, I don't care yeah. what these, like, IDW weirdos say. And just, you know, let me just say real quickly, you know, if you want to end this, but just to, to, to get at this, like... This centrist pose, because it, it is a pose, it doesn't work, right? Like, Claire Lemon is a liar and a bad person, right? Like, she knows that most people on, like, the proverbial left, quote-unquote, they still think she's, like, a fascist Nazi white supremacist. Like, her, um, like, ridiculous, dumb statements don't actually curry favor with anyone, and they don't... Yeah, they still call her as, like, anytime yeah. she posts, it's like, how are you How are you measuring craniums? Like, how, how's the craniology yeah. coming along? They still call her, like, a race scientist, and she still posts, and she still even will throw people who talk about race science under the bus just for respectability. It's like that really embarrassing account uh, I saw that, what's his name? New Radical Centrism? He's like this guy, he like replied to Claire Lemon's tweet like, thank you for this. Thank you so much, ma'am. Like, can I please get one crumb? Like, th this, this guy's whole Twitter persona is like, guys, here are a bunch of links to like IQ studies to show how dumb non-white people are. But also, <laughs> I, will not, I will not vote for Trump for he is rude. Like, it's literally, like, yeah, I may be racist. Like the real way to resist the woke is to vote for Biden, and it's, like, such a joke. Yeah, and I think, like, these people are a clown. I think I think they are losing prestige in the uh, yeah, like, post-Trump like, era, unfortunately. I, have, I just have to say this, Scott, because, like, you, you know, you say they're losing prestige, but, like, it's true. But I just yeah. have to point this out, that, like, the, 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 the whole idea that, like, you know, you're this like anonymous, you know, whatever. You're like this groiper account. You have like a Pepe AV and like you don't have any prestige next to like Claire Lemon or or like the, the Weinstein brothers. Like, no, man, like these are insincere trolls. Like these are people who are calculating what they say in order to preserve their career. Like they're the ones that are saying things that are just laughably untrue in order to maintain like a social position like they're the trolls they're the ones that are insincere they're not being themselves right like you like anonymous people on twitter 
are being themselves more than like people like Claire Lemon. And the other thing I want to say just just quickly is that you know this is a kind of stock insincere response that you get from a lot of conservatives and a lot of people like you know the Quillette crowd. You know as much as I like Jordan Peterson, he did this too, and it's a total cop out. They and it's it's in a lot of ways I feel like the left kind of has their number so to speak on this. You cannot simply brush off social problems with individual solutions, right? Like, and yeah. that's exactly what Claire Lemon did. And it's what makes her so stupid and dumb and ugly and, you know, deserving of all these awful things happening to her and whatever, and basically irrelevant. Like, you know, if someone says that like, oh, well, you know, you have mass immigration into a country and you have massive demographic shifts and someone looks at you and says, oh, do you have kids? Like, that's the most just ridiculous. have kids like if you yeah. if you marry a, a libtarded woman and you have kids she will definitely be okay with your uh peppy griper <laughs> hobby online and like yeah there's like there is like a point i want to make my final point is like the other thing about like uh, people insisting like having a marriage and kids it like does ensure that certain people aren't going to take risks i mean for obvious reasons it's like okay if i speak out i'm going to lose my job and i'm not going to be able to take care of my children and like yeah that's that's like perfectly sensible and that's like all and also like women are social creatures they're usually herd they're herd animals that follow the herd and they don't necessarily want to have the opprobrium that follows uh being married to a racist so there's like these things is like if you the people are going to have to speak out and like you know do this stuff uh, like even under their own names or even people who are doing this like full time and under like pseudonymously a lot of them are not going to necessarily be uh the typical have the typical typical features of like a normal bourgeois white person because exactly. they have to forego exactly. that in order to speak the truth and that's like one of the like effects of it like uh, <laughs> it's not like you're going to be like uh, I, I, but some people imagine that like you're gonna lead this like powerful dissident movement that's like marching everywhere and that you're somehow still like uh the, like carrying your kids along and like the whole brood is like following you along it's like and like the wife is totally fine with it. i mean there are some women who are like that but i mean they're few and far between and generally uh most you know white american women are gonna demand that you're but for and this is like a sensible reason i'm not necessarily hating on this i mean that's like focus on your family first and ensure that you don't do anything that's going to risk us having not only losing like financially but losing uh social repute i mean they don't necessarily want their kids bullied as like the kid uh, like the child of racist either so this is something to keep in mind i don't and i think we're both in agreement it's like yes having kids is is awesome we want people to have kids we want people to have healthy families but it's not it's not a solution. It's not. It's something well, yeah, you do. It's something you do as a human being, and it's something you want to do is like to procreate yourself. And we don't encourage necessarily people being uh, lifelong bachelors or anything like that, or being incels. But I think it, in a lot of like the social things that are happening today, not even regardless of your politics, it is like harder to like have like a normal, stable family. Just as, just like as a normal person, not even like as like uh, forgetting politics. And I think it also puts all this onus on like the man's responsibility to just like go out like outside his door and saying like, I'm ready to marry. And then like the women somehow come and it's like, I am normal. I am not racist. I'm, I follow Claire Lehman's advice and like now I'm going to get married. And it's like, uh, that's not necessarily how it works. So. And it's, they and always it's like to, it's like your point is like they assume that all these social problems can be solved by individual choice, which is uh, not true at all. So that would be my final yeah, point. It's, if it's you have a, any, if you have any further to, final thoughts, uh, speak them right now. <laughs> it's important. It's important to point out how that is a cop out. That like it, on its on their own terms, like leftists are superior to them. They talk about like collective political action to solve political problems. You know. That's what politics is, right? Politics derives from man's social nature. There's no such thing as in politics for like an individual, right? Like an individual person living on like an island by himself somewhere would not have a politics. Politics is necessarily social. And so like, especially for someone who like styles themselves as like a pundit, who's like, you know, having like relevant commentary on like important issues, for them to have this like cop out where they respond to 
the the bringing up of like social and political issues with like uh you know just solely individual actions and then anyone who ref anyone who doesn't agree with that and who tries to acknowledge that no 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 these are these are social problems that require uh social solutions and an, an approach that acknowledges like you know like large numbers and like collective action and stuff like that 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 must be like compensation for like personal failures it's like a total mm. manipulative psychological uh attack and th that's where like ridiculous insults like incel come from like it's all like a cop-out and it's really irresponsible and like i said on its own the left is actually better like they offer you a better alternative than that you know what i mean because you will never you know like the ben shapiro claire lemon quillette whatever like conservative response that like oh just like you know if ever if everything's bad around you you should just like just pick turn off the tv and focus on your you know? family it's like yeah don't boycott yeah, it's don't not like an insert answer. yourself politically and to conclude you know on our on our original point you know you will not stop the buck breaking by just having a family so that's a that's a <laughs> i think that's a good way to conclude this point um got nightmare vision any final thoughts that you have no all I'm right good. that's a great way to end. but anyway all tell the listeners make sure to follow nightmare vision at glide oh uh, wow, I fucked that. <laughs> Follow him at God Close My Eyes at, on Twitter. And of course, make sure to subscribe to Highly Respected Substack at highlyrespected.substack.com. And so you can listen to IQ Supplements. We will have a new IQ Supplement this week. It should be on Wednesday. So with that in mind, thank you, Nightmare Vision, for coming on again. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks a lot. And you're welcome. And until next time, stay respected.